Okay, the next show okay, is the Encyclopedia Show. Really super excited about that. I'm going to let you guys explain what you do. Is that cool? Yeah, okay, yes, very cool. awesome. Uh, the Encyclopedia Show includes fearless comedy members of Doug Washington, Kelvin Hotley, Kyle, and Jenna Young. Plus, we have other performers that will be joining them, which is Cole, Mickey, and Chickadee Dee. So, ladies and gentlemen. I, I am also a fearless comedy member. Oh, I did so. Sorry. <laughs> Doug didn't give me your name. I'll talk to Eric and Knight about that later. Anyways, and Matthew Kesson, who is also a fearless comedy member. Woo -woo. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Encyclopedia Show. Yay! Hello. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. My name is Matt Kesson. I'm a fearless comedy member. What? <laughs> <laughs> and this is the Encyclopedia Show. To begin it, I would like to call up to the stage your host for this afternoon's Encyclopedia Show, Howard the Duck Washington. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Encyclopedia Show. For those of you who don't know, the Encyclopedia Show is a show that we do every month at Kieran's Irish Pub. Uh, it happens on various different Sundays. It's not always the same Sunday every month, but it is always on a Sunday at 7 o'clock. Uh, and the way the show basically works is each month we have a different encyclopedia topic. This, month, this show's topic is empires, and we get a bunch of different artists to go out and create short pieces of art based on that topic. We don't really tell them exactly how they want, need to present that. Sometimes it could be poetry or a song or a TED Talk. Um, we've seen all kinds of different, we've seen sculptures with food at the Encyclopedia Show. You never quite know what you're going to get. Um, uh, one of the, the, the tricky things about the show is we do, as, as Mr. Kesson has pointed out, have an Encyclopedia Show fact checker. Uh, uh, Matt, do you want to talk a little bit about what your job in the show is? Yes. Uh, for Die Laughing so far, we've had a very open sort of experience, uh, very welcoming to all sorts of different sorts of performers. And they are welcomed warmly and rewarded for their efforts. Now, it is time to be judged. <laughs> and uh, that is me who will be doing it. I know everything, everything that there is. And so when people give their presentations, I will be judging those presentations in terms of truths and lies, numerically. I will count off the truths and the lies in every single performance. And, uh, and then at the end, we will see whether the truths or lies have won in aggregate. If the truths win, then we are all rewarded with a sense of personal accomplishment. If the lies win, we release the poison gas. So, <laughs> all right, so the stakes Watch here, it. the stakes here are, are uh, merriment or, per or personal gas. So <laughs> um, let's hope that our, our, our presenters are full of truths today and let's go ahead and get this edutainment started. Please welcome to the stage one of our favorite performers, Kelvin Hotley. <laughs> Grach edge to one. Gold mock we ah can bend to shaka dark da we shock conos. Gun gold shock dark. Tak klingon wo gash tak wish pat huch dish we have vat dish pong kelis hush ar hi hoch edge jau van lukara nelu kelis Chepuk wa shanid wa wa vatl tish. Nuk shok vad kin mu ne edge kapku mo. Ha 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 
Shum pek kau, desh du, tong vej, je, dah, no vam, no i ta. Gje, nër ek, mal gja, ti gjeq, ha, moh, bat let me, kek, lik, iv. Miu qah, gjah, edj, wedj, khuq, lat, khuq, shufwi. Teh, bal, shufwi. Got to lu, nej, wa, shanit, wedj, wa, batu, konos, jot. Hr-k-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-l-
Wat is lok leer? Doek li poe. Tjurg kling aan poe. Goe man. Tja, wat is niet? Tja, wat wat waar? Wat mag edge vers? Je divi jav te kuvma. Kashtach wish dish lau torch rat kab. Kirk Peach Mach. Cha wash a need cha wa bat good wa mach wedge edge jaw pa kish mash. Ba kur nuj tingu raj god vat. Jet TV Roj with Kang Gorkhan. It's of Chok Kop. Pick Gurme Klingon Wo Vaj Nook. Lach nech wa be. Osh po och. Dach my klug mach. Give it up for Kelvin Hatley, everybody. Remember a few minutes ago when I said you just don't know what to expect in the show? <laughs> this is what I was talking about. Oh, man. Kling Klingons are some funny motherfuckers. I never knew. <laughs> um, uh, and, our, and our live stream is confused as fuck right now. <laughs> uh, oh, awesome. Oh, look at that. That's, ooh. Our tech skills are on point. Uh, Mr. Kesson, um, uh, what did you think of Mr. Hotley's performance? Uta Guta Solom? Solom Pichale. Imara Tom Titok Maki Chisa. Cheskoba Tuta Krista Krenko Yakolska. Also, actually, I also need to give a lie for somehow managing to cover 75% of the stage with paper. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank We're you. We're tied. All right, so it's still a close match. Everybody give it up for Calvin one more time. And let's bring our next excellent performer to the stage. He is a fearless member as well. Please welcome Kyle Decker. I'm not going to speak in Klingon, sorry. Elvish. Can you do Elvish? No. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so the, the topic was empires, and uh, I was going to do something else, but this affected another performance. I found out the news of a new Star Wars character this week that Denny's is promoting. Okay. And uh, this character is in the new Solo movie. He's a lobster man, and he has claws, and he wears a nice vest, and he eats noodles, and his name is Therm Scissorhands. And for those of you who don't follow every bit of Star Wars news like I do, that's okay. I at least got married before I let this one out of the bag. Uh, one of my very favorite things in Star Wars is the grand tradition of these ridiculous names, especially of aliens and characters that often describe who they are, but doesn't have to, but often they do. And when this 
news went wide, uh, Star Wars Twitter went aflame, and many of your angry fanboys, you can expect, like, the about The Last Jedi, because there's too many women in it and everything, thought this was a further example of the Disneyfication of Star Wars, and, and once again, this is a long, grand tradition of Star Wars, so I'm going to explain how much of a tradition this is. Uh, and don't forget, oh, while you're at Denny's, they're not sponsoring this, but I'm hoping to get some kind of sponsorship from a media company. So when you go to get your collectible trading cards, to get your, uh, you know, hopefully Therm scissor hands, but you can also, you know, get Lando and Chewbacca, Han Solo, but you can also get a Blaster Fire Burger, co-reactor pancakes with a side of Crystal Crunch Rocks. I think that's literally just Pop Rocks they put in maple syrup. I'm... <laughs> Two Moons Skillet and a Denny's Light Sweet Slam. I'm very disappointed they don't have that's no moon over my hammy. Uh, but I'm indeed fond of breakfast food, but you know, the real thing, the real star of this promotion is Therm Scissor Punch. Who is Therm Scissor Punch, may you ask? Once again, he's an anthropomorphic lobster man with a stylish coat. Uh, anthropomorphic lobster man. They called him Therm Scissor Punch. But look back at it in the beginning. Let's, let's go in some of, you know, it says Star Wars is blue milk to have a ridiculous name. Let's start from the very first film. The Tusken Raider who harasses Luke and does the famous uh, rifle uh, crossfit routine. Uh, his name is <laughs> which is spelled capital U, capital R, lower, lowercase o, capital R, capital R, lowercase u, capital R, apostrophe, capital R, apostrophe, capital R. That is canon. It's on the Star Wars databank. I don't know how that helps pronounce the name, but it looks really freaking cool on a trading card. <laughs> Continuing early in Star Wars, you have Jet Porkins, the fat pilot who can't get up. <laughs> Sometimes I feel personally affronted by that character, but it's still pretty damn funny. Uh, going to the uh, Clone Wars era in the Clone Wars television series, which is canon and has many enjoyable arcs. The very first villain was a Separatist general named Warm Loathsome. He was a bad guy. Just in case you weren't. Then uh, further in the same era, there's Dexter Jetser, the uh, bat. Beastalist, the forearm diner owner and friend of Obi-Wan Kenobi who liked showing his butt crack because we all wanted to see that CGI rendered on sp in HD. Uh, further in the Clone Wars era, Darth Maul, who came back alive and got robot legs to wield war on Mandalore and get involved in their civil war and get betrayed by the Emperor and everything, had a brother. His brother was a big, angry alien as well named Savage Opress. He was also a bad guy. <laughs> Further in the Clone Wars era, this is, this is peak, like, people say it's not Star Wars. When Lucas was peak unfiltered, like, he was capable of some amazing things. <laughs> you have your uh, betentacle death sticks dealer in the Coruscant Casino in episode two called Elon Sleazebagano. <laughs> he was a sleazebag. Uh, going back to the original trilogy, this is fun. Uh, the laughing, kawaking monkey lizard who sits faithfully by Jabba the Hutt and is basically Jabba's hype man. He is, you know, Flavor Flav, about four years before Flavor Flav was a known entity. Uh, Salacious B. Crumb. That, that's that monkey's name. Uh, going back to the Clone Wars, I, I didn't want to just cram all Clone Wars, but uh, there's a really great single arc episode of a Jedi Master who sacrifices his life to sa save all the Twi'leks on Ryloth. If you didn't understand any of those words I just said, that's okay, you get out more than me. But this Jedi Master who was a one arc and sacrificed his life, it was a bottle episode, was, his name was Ama Gun Die. <laughs> These are all canon. Uh, going back to another bad guy you've all heard of. He's a bad guy, General Grievous. He did bad things, guys. Get it? Uh, you got Saboba, the Doug. That's his species, Podracer. 
He's not really a dumb name, it's just a cool name, and so Bulba's really cool, and we forget how cool he was because people dismiss the prequel trilogy, but that pod race was really cool, and so Bulba was a big reason for it. Uh, back to the uh, prequel trilogy, the Nemoidian politicians, the, the Trade Federation aliens, they were named after Leonard Nimoy, that's where the name, they originally want to call them Shatnerians, but someone in Lucasfilm decided to shoot that down, I don't know how... But they had, the two main characters were named after real American politicians. You have Newt Gunray, who was named after Newt Gingrich, and Lot Dodd, who was named after Republican Senator Trent Lott. Both of these alien villains were shitbags, like their namesake. <laughs> There's a background character in, uh, in uh, episode three, George Lucas put in and played himself. He's one of only on time screen appearances, but he's way in the background. His character name, this is George Lucas, is Not Lewiski Papanoidia. Not Lewiski. It's not Lucas, but it's Lucas. Ha ha. Once again, get it. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorites from the original trilogy, Droopy McCool, <laughs> who is a member of Sny Snoodles and the Max Rebo Band. Now, there's three band members in the Sny Snoodles and the Max Rebo Band. He's the only one whose name isn't in the name of the band because he's so, he's sad. He's Droopy McCool. He's a, Kitonak is his species, and he plays a horn. So then uh, uh, our, our fact checker actually gave us some of the Rodian language earlier when he was judging the Klingon, and we have Greedo, the, the Rodian bounty hunter, who was greedy. And then uh, going to the new movies in episode seven, J.J. Abrams, a big uh, Beastie Boys fan, named one of the alien X-Wing pilots and gave him lines in the movie, Elo Asti. So, you like that. Uh, and finally, I'm going to bring in all the... I, I would be remiss if I did not mention the Star Wars Holiday Special, because there has some real gems of names in there, mostly of Chewbacca's Wookiee relatives, Itchy, Lumpy, and Mala. So thus I conclude that Therm Scissor Punch is here to stay in his rightful B-clawed right hand, whatever the thing on a crustacean is called, that's the scientific one. I know it's a claw, but so whatever it's called, I'll lose points for that. But it's, he's here to stay, and he enjoys a, enjoys a place alongside these other great, amazing, illustrative names of Star Wars. And the next time someone says Therm Scissor Punch is the least Star Wars thing ever, Remember some of these names and tell him he's one of the most Star Wars things ever created. Thank you. Kyle Decker, everybody. Kyle Decker. All right. The Encyclopedia Show is, is nerdy as fuck. Whew, we got All right, a slideshow going on up there. Let me um, let me be as quick as I can with yes, this because yes, there's a please. lot to cover. Uh, you may have seen that at the beginning. I uh, I gave two points just right as you started talking. This is because Kyle Decker is aware that I am the world's biggest Therm Scissor Punch fan, and that this was basically pandering to me, the fact checker, which is fine. He got points for it. Um, he also gets a point for, uh, for pointing out that Sebulba is cool as hell. It is, it is uh, all too infrequently uh, expressed, and Sebulba is, in fact, cool as hell. So point for that. Thank you very much. Uh, you got a whole bunch of weird-ass Star Wars names. I'm just going to give you five points for all them Star Wars names, because you had a whole bunch of truths there. However, at the beginning of the talk, you referred to Therm Scissor Punch as Therm Scissor Hands twice. So that's two. Um, let's see. You said that if you didn't understand about Twi'leks from Ryloth, that that's okay. That is not okay. <laughs> In discussing Droopy McCool, you neglected to mention that he was named that because of how cool he is. So, uh, so yeah. um, I was not speaking Rodian, but Hutty. <laughs> you said you would be remiss not to bring up the Star Wars Holiday Special. That's wrong. <laughs> And in mentioning stupid names from old Star Wars movies, you said nothing about the fish people who are named Mon Calamari. So, <laughs> so there we are. So what, so what are we at total-wise now? We're at ten truths to nine lies. Whoa, yeah. So we got a slight lead. All right. Let's see if we can keep this train rolling. Please welcome to the stage the awesome Cole Sarar. <laughs> Can I get a chair, please? Oh, 
<clears throat> Hi, I'm Cole Sarar, and I'm a first-generation Turkish-American. As such, I will be presenting on the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> because why did Constantinople get the works? Shh, that's my business, not yours. <laughs> so, put up your feet and get ready to talk Ottoman Empire and our sieges on Constantinople. This is your warning that we're about to do an educational series of furniture-related puns. Delivered as terribly as humanly possible, so listen for puns and feel free to groan audibly whenever you hear one. If I said that this was going to be merely painful, I'd be being charitable. Charitable. <laughs> Buckle your seatbelt, it's not going to get better. Now, I know I don't have a lot of time, so we're not going to get too couched in the ins and outs of the conquests of Constantinople. Mm -hmm. But you can be, sure, be assured that the SETI's strategic placement, the SETI's strategic placement, my non-furniture nerds in the audience might like to know that a SETI is a long upholstered seat for more than one person. Uh, the city's uh, strategic placement on the Bosphorus, a strait between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, is a big part of why Constantinople got the works. If you know your Middle Eastern geography, you know that modern Istanbul, which used to be Constantinople, sits both on Europe and Asia right on this strait. This will be important later. It took a whole bunch of leaders of the Ottoman Empire, chairmen, if you will, to conquer Constantinople, but aiding Constantinople was Timur, a Mongol dude who had a walking difficulty. That's where Tamerlane comes from, no joke. There was a rumor that Timur went barefoot, but I can assure you, he has sock. Hasik. Ha has sock. <clears throat> he just had a different way of putting his foot on the ground. Foot on the ground. <laughs> So, the first Ottoman dudes trying to sack the city were Bayezid, Mehmet, and Chelebi brothers, all successfully fighting Timur, unsuccessfully, sorry, unsuccessfully fighting Timur in the 1410s. Eventually, they decided to table the whole thing for a bit. But the Byzantine Empire kept trying to meddle in the Sultanate, so in the 1420s, this dude Murad, that's Murat in Turkish, decided to take the battle to him, this time with cannons. So far, so good. <laughs> One of Murat's sons burned down the suburbs. Murat's got his game ruling, but Murat's little brother, little Mufasa, Mustafa, sorry, little Mustafa, could only be trusted as far as he was thrown. Thrown. <laughs> and rebelled, fracturing the attack, thinking only of himself. <sighs> another year, another siege. Meanwhile, the Constantinopoles knew they could just tough it out. Like Little Miss Muffet, tough it. It's also a footstool. After all, they were the seat of power. <laughs> but then come the 1450s. We come to the final battle. So Constantinople is the best defended city of all time. Huge walls, and more importantly, a big ass chain strung up like an enormous tripwire across the strait to, get to, uh, to keep big, big ships with big, big cannons out of the city so they were resting easy. <clears throat> big, big chain anchored from Europe to Asia means no big, big ships with big, big cannons to shoot the city from waterside. Whew. All right, so these guys, they're Christian. It's just after Easter. They've had their big meal, and so they're relaxing after the hammock occasion. Hammock occasion. <laughs> but then comes Mehmet the Conqueror. They didn't actually call him that after, until after the battle, but that's what, what we call him now. Now, Mehmet was not a lazy boy. <laughs> no. Mehmet had the glint of insight, the spark of intelligence, the papa sanity. Papa sanity. Yes. <laughs> um, the big, big chain wasn't going to stop his ships. No. His army greased logs and then used those greased logs to move the ships. He'd have a port the ships over a hill and past the big ass chain. Do you catch that one? 
Hey, Davenport. Davenport. I always thought that uh, they called couches Davenports because of Davenport, Iowa, but research tells me that that's not the case. <clears throat> anyway, the Ottoman forces dug tunnels under the city walls and set an elite force of young Christian men through to chase lounging defenders. Chase lounging defenders. <laughs> The Janissaries is this whole weird thing that I won't get into in my five minutes here. In fact, you'll have to take my word that this is completely ina incomplete and inaccurate description of the fall of Constantinople, that there were a lot of politics and back and forth that I'm not getting into here. The final assault include, involved using gunpowder to assault newer, weaker points in the wall, and with the era of cannon tech, the defending Constantines couldn't use cannons to fight back without damaging the walls themselves. So, poof. Poof, that's another kind of footstool. <laughs> ah, poof! <sighs> poof! Anyway, Byzantium had been bagged. Been bagged. <laughs> Thank you, I will see myself out. <laughs> Let's give it up for Cole Sarat. We're all going to get poisoned to death. <laughs> I'm afraid to ask, Mr. Kesson. All right. <laughs> two They Might Be Giants references. Two truths. Uh, let's see. Oh, I can barely even remember what's just happened. Um, you said that something would be important later, and it sure was. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> Your history was all real good. And at one point, you went into a gratuitous British accent, which lends credibility to, any, to everything. However, <laughs> according to my running tally, there were 17 of those goddamn things. <laughs> I was going to give you a lie for each and every one. Instead, I've decided to give you a lie for every four. <laughs> so, one, two, three, four, and a quarter. And I also forgot earlier to, uh, to bring your attention to the drawing I did of therm scissor punch, which is the only thing keeping me from gouging out my own eyes right now. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's give it up for Cole. And let's keep this show rolling. Are you guys ready for your next edutainer? Please welcome to the stage, Mickey Foley. Today I'd like to talk about the first official empire most of us encountered in our lives. The evil empire. Slide. No, not that one. Th this one. Slide. Now some might say that we demonized the Soviet Union and invented the Galactic Empire in order to have something on which we could project the sub sublimated guilt about our own imperial crimes. Slide. But these people are clearly Russian stooges who can be dismissed out of hand. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, my main sources of research for this presentation were Wikipedia and Wookiepedia. Where they differed, I generally went with the Wookie. As I'm sure you all remember, the Galactic Empire arose from the ashes of the Galactic Republic. Slide. Queen Amidala's speech to the Galactic Senate in Episode 3 was unable to stop Palpatine's rise to absolute power. Luckily, it was enough to shame George W. Bush slide, into resigning from the presidency and turning himself in to the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Humanity. In spite of the Queen's brave words and even braver hairdos, Shiv Palpatine, a.k.a. the Sith Lord Darth Sidious, went ahead and declared the founding of the First Galactic Empire. Slide. Okay. FYI, I didn't actually know that Shiv was Palpatine's first name. I thought it was Palpatine. But in conducting research for this presentation, 
I was reminded of many things from the prequels that I had repressed. As Wikipedia puts it, Darth Vader was, quote, the Emperor's second in command and his ruthless chief enforcer, greatly feared throughout the galaxy, unquote. For those of us who remember the George W. Bush administration and are unable to afford medication strong enough to forget it, he was like the Dick Cheney to Palpatine's W. Slide. Now, the Senate continued as the Emperor's rubber stamp for almost 20 years, but was finally dissolved when Palpatine realized that it would streamline the narrative. His experience as a senator had shown him the dangers of a story getting bogged down in parliamentary proce procedure. Slide. Thank you. Oh God. Uh, this merely formalized the system that was already in place, in which power resided with planetary system administrators who reported to the sector governors, or MOFs, slide, who in turn reported to the quadrant governors, or grand MOFs, slide. Although I'm sure they had to resist the urge to go over the moth, MOF's head straight to the grand MOF, because no matter how much you love your MOF, you know your grand MOF is going to be more lenient. Wish I had more puns, damn. Uh, due to rampant corruption in the waning years of the Republic, the transition to empire mainly involved changing the names of things from galactic to imperial. The capital, Galactic City, became Imperial City. The Galactic Senate became the Imperial Senate. And for some reason, Shasta, slide, became Royal Crown Cola, slide. The currency of the Republic, the Republic Credit, was replaced by the Imperial Credit. Unfortunately, these could only be used at participating Dave and Busters. Slide. <laughs> the credits also had little value, so most people could only afford the mustache combs. <laughs> In addition to the name changes, there was an aesthetic change. The Republic had employed sweeping lines in its architecture. But the Empire preferred bold, brutalist designs. According to Wikipedia, and I quote, that new style actually emerged before the foundation of the Empire, during the Clone Wars, when the architect, Orson Krennic, transformed the municipal grounds on Coruscant into military command centers. A prime example of Krennic's work was the Repub Republic Center for Military Operations. Slide. Not surprisingly, the Empire demanded loyalty from its citizens and subjects. Attendance was mandatory for the Imperial holiday, Empire Day, which featured parades on Empire-controlled planets and the playing of the Imperial anthem, Glory of the Empire, which we know as the Imperial March, Darth Vader's theme from the films. Officially, religion was outlawed, although the New Order constituted a political religion, slide, While it may not have had the hipster cachet of its predecessor, Joy Division, it was considered by many to be catchier, more accessible, and far more danceable. <laughs> Censorship was enforced by the Coalition of Progress, a division of COPNOR, the Commission for the Preservation of the New Order. They dismantled a statue of Janior of Bith on the outer rim world of Garel, or Garel, I'm not sure, sorry. Uh, they banned subversive operas like the Song of Lejeune, slide, and they sent the band Hacko Draslip and the Tootlefruits to work in the Kessel Spice Mines after the release of their political song, Vader's Many Prosthetic Parts. That? But tragedy struck in the year 4 ABY, in other words, four years after the Battle of Yavin. The rebel fleet destroyed the second Death Star as it orbited the forest moon of Endor, and Palpatine was murdered by his protege, Darth Vader, who also died soon after. This power vacuum left the Empire in disarray, leading to its chaotic final year, 5 ABY, which has come to be known as the year of three shitty emperors. 
<clears throat> Grand Vizier Masamita, slide, was the first to take the reins. He gave way to Grand Admiral Ray Sloan, slide, which just goes to show that even the Empire could be woke sometimes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Its final leader was Counselor to the Empire and Fleet Admiral Gallius Rex. Slide. Although today we remember him primarily as a restaurateur. Slide. The Empire only lasted 24 years, but Palpatine did pretty well considering he brought an end to a thousand years of democracy. When you're trying to enslave a galaxy that's known only freedom for a millennium, it's going to take some time to work out the kinks. For an example from our own galaxy, slide, Julius Caesar's dictatorship only lasted five years after he ended the 460-year-old Roman Republic. But the Roman Empire continued for five centuries after his death. Hopefully that will give some comfort to those brave souls in the First Order. Don't give up hope, guys. Slide. Time is on your side. Thank you. Give it up for Mickey Foley, everybody. Man, we got two Star Wars presentations in one show. So far. Oh, yo, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Kesson, what right. you got? Very, very nice work. Uh, at the beginning, you let the Wookiee win, and that is, of course, what you're supposed to do, so that's good. Uh, also, Dick Cheney did play Darth Vader with his mask off, uh, so, that's, so that's true. Uh, it's just a shame that they took his ghost out of it to put in, uh, put in, the, other, the, put in the kid. Um, your picture of Grand Marf Tarkin made him look like a human being rather than a sort of weird, uncanny valley nightmare, so that's a lie. Um, and then also for the going to your Grand Moff because she is more lenient, I'm giving you two points off for that. So, uh, because, I have, because I have been lenient, and now we see what happens. <laughs> that is all. All right, give it up for Mickey Foley one more time. We've got two presenters left to get through, and it brings me great pleasure to bring this next one to you. Put your hands together for Fearless member Jenna Young. You can keep clapping while I readjust. Okay, now stop. I'm, okay, wait. How do I make this one go? Oh. Give it up to Jenny Young! Hey! <laughs> it's been a long however many hours so far. All right. An empire starts small. A fiefdom becomes a collection of fiefdoms, builds into a kingdom. A kingdom might become a collection of kingdoms, and then we have an empire. It takes a lot to run an empire. I know this. Because I play simulated empire building games. You could pretty much call me an expert. <laughs> One of my favorite empire building games is Forge of Empires. Yeah! I like it because it has a fantastic mobile interface, so you can conquer other kingdoms while you're on the go. It's an empire for the busiest of emperors. <laughs> The idea of the game is that you're building your empire not only through conquering other kingdoms, but by building your own specific domain up, moving it forward through the ages. You start in the Stone Age, and you have to achieve certain mission-based research accomplishments to move to the next age. As you conquer other kingdoms, you gain resources to aid you in your research, which allows you to build better goods for trade, collect more money, to house more people, to make more goods, to make more money. Y you understand the cycle. You need to keep your people happy. So you decorate and you build coliseums and other forms of entertainment. You decorate with various statues and trees. You upgrade your roads and you build better houses. In some ways, it's similar to SimCity, but with more statues of Zeus. But there's also the combat element. In your domain, 
<clears throat> you build armies appropriate to your age, and you fight other armies in a turn-based strategy style. There are different army unit types, like range and artillery units, and different units will help or hinder you in a battle. I admit that the mobile application doesn't work quite as well as the browser application, but it's still completely possible to work at it and win, although it takes more steps to set up your attack. With my experience in turn-based strategy games, I'm entirely convinced I could win a real-life battle so long as the enemy kindly waited for me to take my turn, and if I looked to see a unit, I could see what their range of attack was. <laughs> there are also online social aspects to this game. You can battle other players to win medals, which will get you more land to build up your domain. You can jo join guilds to pool resources and play with your guild to conquer other guilds in a separate territorial struggle. Uh, you chat. You make friends, you practice diplomacy. What I love about Forge of Empires is that it isn't just a strategy game, and it's not just a city management simulator, and it's not just a missions-based accomplishment style, but that it interweaves these elements into a world where you need to stretch your brain in each area to move forward. It's exceptionally well-balanced, feeling difficult without being overwhelming, and each style feeds the others in a symbiotic relationship that creates a complex yet functioning world. Now this is an empire. I don't mean the in-game world, though that also applies. I mean, it's right there in the title, Forge of Empires. Now what I'm talking about is the game itself. The structure must have taken many different departments collaborating together to build this complex structure of an in-world experience. The entire creative team is just one large empire of kingdoms working together to make something greater than their individual pieces. The greater accomplishment is an empire of smaller accomplishment kingdoms. I'm sure the developers encountered all sorts of mistakes and failed concepts before finding the balance needed to maintain this empire of a game. I'm certain at one point, one coworker turned to another and said, God damn it, Frank, I need the price of one clay element to be two pieces of wood, or the entire bartering structure just falls apart. An empire isn't built of just its accomplishments, but its failures as well. We don't think of ourselves as empire builders. Often in today's world, we feel like we don't do enough, we're not good enough, we fall, we fail, and we see that as a lack of value, that we have to be perfect. But you don't win every battle. Sometimes you lose and you learn that from that loss, and next time, you can do better. Slowly you learn, slowly you grow, and slowly you build your own personal empire. Give it up for Jenna Young, everybody. Jenna Young. Mr. Kesson. All right. In the, uh, in the little column on this piece of paper I found that I hope nobody needed, uh, I, in, the, in the truth column, I wrote down, this kid's played Forge of Empires. Um, <laughs> so, that's, so that's the truth. Um, you also get, I'm also giving a point for, uh, for her being completely unstoppable in spite of the large number of extremely heavy objects that impacted with the floor backstage and in the audience throughout her performance. So, uh, so that's, so that's, so that's some nice work there. Uh, as far as lies are concerned, uh, you said that uh, Forge of Empires has more statues of, uh, statues of Zeus than SimCity. I would play SimCity making cities entirely out of statues of Zeus, so no. Um, <laughs> And, uh, let's see, you said that uh, next time you can do better. No. <laughs> <laughs> that is all. All right, so what does that put our oh, running yeah, total at? We're at 19 to 18 and a quarter. Ooh. Yeah. So we're going into our last performer yeah. up three quarters of a point. It's correct. All right, so everything is riding on this. We either have merriment or we die of poison, and we leave it to the wonderful Chickity D, everybody! Nope. 
pressure. Sheesh. A little insight into how my brain works. The topic is empires. Ooh, talk about Star Wars. Star Wars, really? That's what comes to your mind first? There's how many actual empires in history, and your first reaction to that word is a galactic empire? Wait. How many actual empires have there been in history? Shit. I don't think I actually know that. Oh my god, I should have paid more attention in history class instead of writing notes in my sparkled gel pen Lisa Frank notebook. But sparkled gel pens were the bomb, so who can really blame me? Maybe I shouldn't say bomb or gel pens when we're talking about empires. That seems insensitive. Besides, I can't do Star Wars. People will see right through that. <sighs> then I would have to admit that I have never seen the original Star Wars trilogy in its entirety. Nope, not going to go there. Nope, not going to go with galactic empires. It needs to be something else. Hmm. Galactic empire Google search. Let's see. I look at the list of galactic empires outside of Star Wars, and I realize I know nothing on that list except for Dune. I have never heard any of these names. I think I just need to admit to myself that I spent almost my entire childhood and adulthood reading nonfiction memoirs and uh, books about cats. So I probably won't be able to pull off this topic. I know, I'm better at personal stories. Let's do a personal story. Why don't I talk about uh, that time I gave up an entire year of my life working under a woman who was trying to build her own business empire? I'm not sure that's really funny. Uh, of course, there was the time where I worked on our business plan for three months, and then she told me we weren't going to need a business plan because we were an organization run by women, and women run businesses with emotions, not plans. Mm. <laughs> And uh, who needs numbers anyway? Investors. Investors need numbers, that's who. Mm -hmm. Or that time that I told her um, it wasn't professional to keep yelling at me and she told me that she couldn't really trust me if she wasn't allowed to yell at me. Or how about that part where we were constantly asked to work for free or less money or bring our spouses in on their days off or even have our spouses take days off to help? That's kind of empire-ish, right? I mean, what's an empire without the backs of the people you build it on? But no, I better not go there. That seems a little too bitter, dark. I don't know. Ooh, wasn't there that TV show called Empire? What was that about? Was that about music? Hmm. Ooh, I could do something about music or recording. I could sing a song. Who am I kidding? I'm terrified of karaoke. I can't do that. <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. The word empire just kind of freaks me out. Like, it has such negative connotations in my head whether it's a business empire or an actual empire or a galactic one? Can there even be an ethically built empire? Or is an empire by definition predicated on the oppression of others? Can there be fair ruling with that much power so unevenly distributed? Wait a minute, am I getting empires and dictatorships confused? Oh my God. Or maybe I could talk about the Catholic Church. I feel like they kind of have their own little empire. It's not really that little getting smaller. There is certainly a rise and fall story there. And I have a lot of personal experience. 15 years in Catholic school, mm -hmm, all the way into college. My mom, you know that one time she sent me to get an exorcism? That could be a good story. Or dealing with all that sexual repression? That could be fun, but maybe slightly tangential. Back to empires. Why didn't they mention Stargate in that galactic empires list? That empire was vast and it was divided into individual domains ruled by the system lords? Am I the only person who was in love with Stargate SG-1? I can't be the only person who realized that they were most definitely interested in women when Val Mal Duran showed up, am I right? Am I the only one who has had pictures of her tan lace dress on their holy grail, on their cosplay vision board? Am I the only person who has a cosplay vision board? <sighs> cosplay, that's it. That's usually my shtick with the encyclopedia show anyway. I usually come dressed up in something related to the topic. Ooh, maybe I should have made my husband take work off. We could do a stormtrooper duet dance. Our Care Bears duet where he wore that cloud suit and I was the Care Bear one pretty well. Or maybe I should branch out. I could write a space rock opera or design my own empire. Or, or, or I could take my daily ADD medication. 20 minutes later, complete singularity of focus. I totally know what empire I'm going to talk about. If you had chatted with me at all in the last few weeks, it is likely <laughs> that I have made sure that you are aware that Toys R Us is going out of business and that their fixtures are being sold for super cheap. And not only that, but they are now 50% off of super cheap. 
Hearing that the toy store giant, Toys R Us, was closing its doors to more than 700 U.S. stores made the little girl inside me who had waited in line to meet Mr. Jeffrey Giraffe quite sad. Excuse me, sir, we're here to see Mr. Jeffrey, my four-year-old self would say. I said it with professionalism of somebody who was looking for a job interview, and then when he finally roller skated up to me, yes, that's right, we had roller skating mascots at our toy stores because being raised in the 80s was the shit. <laughs> Internally, my level of fanfare towards Jeffrey was that of a girl at a 2009 Justin Bieber concert. That's early Bieber, you know. Not only was he adorable, Jeffrey, not Bieber, he could skate and he shared a name with my favorite cousin, attempting to contain my excitement and not knock him down when I threw my arms around him, channeling my best Oliver impression. Please, sir, may I have some more? And staring at him with the wide eyes of whatever those creepy abomination plush toys are that have sort of merged Beanie Babies and Lilith's Pet Shop, you know, and their eyes are like, don't spring. Um, I asked, please, sir, Will you sign my autograph book? I'm obsessed with vintage toys. I own a vintage toy store in St. Paul, so in my mind, when I think of empires, the rise and fall of the Toys R Us empire comes to mind. By the 80s, the Washington Post had called Toys R Us an American institution, just like McDonald's. What we are is a supermarket for toys, the founder Charles Lazarus once told the Washington Post. We don't have a competitor in variety. There is none. And that was in the 80s. The Toy King, headlines called him, Lazarus never intended to build a toy empire. He came home from World War II where he had served as a cryptologist. His dad owned a small bicycle shop and he wanted to be a small business owner too. So as the GIs were returning, from, returning home, he figured they would be soon in need of baby furniture. In 1948, at the age of 25, Lazarus opened Children's Bargain Town, one of like 15 names before he settled on Toys R Us. Parents began asking him not only where they could buy cribs, but where they could buy toys. So he started to stock a few toys, and he realized that the parents would come back even if the toy broke and buy another one. So with the rise of baby boomers and of television, they really helped make Toys R Us such a success. Lazarus relied heavily on television advertising and always having hot toys like Barbie, hula hoops, or whatever the fad was at the time. The toy emper empire eventually grew to 1,600 stores worldwide. Lazarus used supermarkets to model Toys R Us. Long aisles, products stacked high, variety, big enough to get products at discounts that could be passed on to shoppers. According to an article in the Washington Post, the toy king could play rough, too. Sounds more fun than it probably was. Lazarus offered toy manufacturers a tantalizing picture of year-round toy sales and the ability to produce 12 months a year. Eric Clark wrote in The Real Toy Story, Inside the Ruthless Battle for America's Youngest Consumers. But for that, he could extract a price, and he did. Instead of paying for products right away, he forced toy makers to make payments months later. He demanded exclusives and early releases. He made them advertise for Toys R Us. And with his technology background, he set up a computerized inventory system so that from his desk, he could see every product sold and what needed to be restocked. I think Toys R Us is a unique operation, the only proprietary merchandise company that rivals IBM as revolutionary in concept, a retail analyst told The Post in 1982. Their superb controls and information systems are unrivaled in the industry. Lazarus balanced playing rough with embracing change. As video games came into the scene, he saw that what a market it could be. The gaming industry brought in new demographics like adult customers who didn't have kids. There's an increasingly fine line, he said, between where adults begin and childhood ends. Toys R Us was the place to go in the 70s for the game Simon, and in the 80s for He-Man, Strawberry Shortcake, Cabbage Patch Dolls, they capitalized on the Beanie Baby craze and Tickle Me Elmo. But in the mid-90s, Lazarus left the company, and in 1998, Toys R Us was surpassed for the first time in toy sales by another company, Walmart. The decline continued as box stores like Walmart and Target offered more toy choices, and with the convenience and prices of e-commerce giant like Amazon, Toys R Us didn't really stand a chance. The once very adaptable company wasn't able to adapt to changing landscapes in the toy industry, and since 1998, Eight CEOs have attempted to rebrand or transition Toys R Us. In 2005, a private equity firm bought them out for $6.6 .6 billion, hoping to eventually bring the company public again. But instead, that just saddled them with more debt. In 2015, the flagship store in Times Square closed, and in 2017, Toys R Us filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy and stated that they would close 180 of their stores. But not even that was enough. 
Toys R Us will shut or sell all of its 735 stores in the United States, according to court documents filed this March. About 31,000 workers in the United States will be laid off. When I showed up the first time at the liquidation sale to look at all the fixtures, I ended up meeting one of the managers, and we hit it off right away. I looked around at the piles of toys on the floor, blocking aisles, and clothing spread everywhere. There are these bins that say, please help us by putting these items that you don't want back in the bins. But of course, there are just piles of toys literally thrown on the ground under price scanners. Nope, don't like that price. <laughs> Thanks for helping me, I say. I'm really sorry people are being such assholes. Um, has it just been a complete shit show? <laughs> he laughs. First of all, Toys R Us customers have always been assholes, he says. <laughs> but yeah, it's more awful than usual. I decide right away I like this guy. We talked about the high prices of Toys R Us and how even in liquidation, they were too expensive, and how the demographic of customers had changed somewhere along the way from targeting working, working class families to becoming this upper class suburban entitled clientele. I asked him if, he, if he's going to get a severance pay. He says yes, which is good since he's expecting his first baby soon. He leans in closer to me. My girl's actually my boss here. Whoops, I say, laughing. Not like Toys R Us doesn't have bigger problems than that. He laughs. He says in order for the full-time people to have gotten any kind of severance, though, they had to let go of almost every part-time employee. So every day in this liquidation sale, they are understaffed. He doesn't know where he wants to go next in his life, but he does know that he wants to make music. My mom thinks that's a bad idea with a baby coming, but she gave up her whole life and who she was when she had kids, and I'm not going to do that. I tell him I have, five, I have four kids, and I totally understand what that's like, too, to want to have your kids see you pursue your dreams because that's important for you not to lose yourself and for them to see that example. But worrying about stability can be scary. I had just gotten let go of one of my jobs a few days before the conversation I had with him. So it was one of the mo those moments where two complete strangers just really saw each other. I've been back to the store three times to look at fixtures, and every time he and I remember each other. He met one of my kiddos the other day when I showed up there with a moving truck so that I could keep all the Z-Racks I bought because they're only $20. That's like this big of a clothing rack, people. You should go. The Minnetonka one still has fixtures. Honestly, the toy prices are still terrible, he tells me. Don't shop for toys yet. I'll let you know when they get better. I spent this past week setting up my new toy store in St. Paul. I've been selling vintage toys for seven years, but this is the first time I have a physical space. As I was going through my toys, hanging them up, I saw old Toys R Us stickers on some of the toys still in their original boxes. And I found myself wondering if items with those stickers would soon increase in value because you can't put a price on nostalgia. And you know, there's a few generations of adults that, as Lazarus said, are somewhere between where adults begin and child ends. And we don't want to grow up because baby, if we did, we wouldn't be a Toys R Us kid. Okay. <laughs> Take it easy, everybody. We've run wrong. I've given her a point for, the, for having contempt for Star Wars at the end, which was hilarious. Another point for saying being raised in the 80s was the shit, which it was. And a point off for saying that she could, should have taken more notes instead of using gel pens in her Lisa Frank notebook. That is a lie. Thank you. All right. Uh, so who did we win? Yes. 21 to 19 and picture of Thurm Scissor Punch. Awesome. Thank you very much. We were the Encyclopedia Show. Um, we have a show next Sunday at Karen's uh, on the 15th about our theme is going to be records. Um, and we're going to turn it over to the show. <laughs>